Okay. So John Green talked a lot about various different aspects of Jefferson's governance, including his time with John Marshall in the Supreme Court and his um, shrinking of the national debt and shrinking of the Army and Navy. And these are things that I'm not going to also cover in this lecture. I want to focus on Jefferson's policy of expansion and what impact it had on the country. Um, Jefferson, as you learned from the little video, was very much a proponent of expansion of a large United States, but also held back by the constitutional question of the fact that it's not written in the Constitution anywhere that the president has the right to acquire uh, land to double the size of the country. As we're going to see, one of the things that happens after the acquisition of the Louisiana Purchase is the sending of the Corps of Discovery, as it was called, uh, Lewis and Clark Expedition, as you may have heard it otherwise referred to. This is, these are the two leaders of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark. And I will be talking more about them um, in a few slides. It's, it's just so you know what they look like. This is the path that the Corps of Discovery took. They set off in 1804 from St. Louis in the Missouri Territory. They went out to the Pacific um, in Oregon country, which sort of the territory combining what is today Oregon and what is today Washington state. And when they came back, they split up for a short while so that they could cover more territory, which is why you see them uh, diverging on the inbound voyage. Okay, so Jefferson, as you guys know, was various things. He was a Democratic Republican. He was an advocate of the French. He was an advocate of states' rights. And he was an advocate of small farming. Why was he concerned about the small size, well, small size, the relatively small size of the United States at this time? He didn't want the United States to go the direction of England and develop really um, embedded class differences based on property ownership. In England, 75% uh, of the land was held in by like less than 20% of the people. A lot of the land was owned directly by the crown, some was owned by the church, but very few common people had small farms. And what this meant, even by the time Jefferson was around, you know, the early 1800s was urbanization with lots of problems and issues, grinding poverty in many places, low wages. And if you're going to have a democratic republic in which all white men ultimately have political participation, and they all need to have property. They all need to have a stake in governance represented by being politically independent, as it said in the video. Another thing that was on Jefferson's mind was the economist Thomas Malthus. This is at the very beginning of the science, often referred to as the dismal science of economics. He wrote, an essay in the Principle of Population in 1798, which said that humans experience the same kind of population disasters potentially as other kinds of species. That the population growth is exponential, but the food supply does not increase exponentially. And at some point where the yellow line crosses the white line, there are going to be disasters like famine and war over resources. 
Malthus really didn't have a lot of patience for poor people. He kind of thought that the best way to deal with poverty um, was to tell people to marry later so that they would have smaller families. He was not an advocate of artificial birth control. He was not an advocate of higher wages. But Jefferson saw another possibility here, which is that you could maybe change the slope of the food supply curve by bringing more land under cultivation. Was Thomas Malthus an econ? Sorry, was Thomas Malthus an economist? Yes. Okay. He was one of the um, sort of innovators of the science of economics before all of the things that we're familiar with, like supply and demand curves and that sort of thing, have been perfected. The very early economists were called political economists, and they worked very much in the realm of the hypothetical. So one of the things that some of them believed in this time was that um, supply creates demand rather than that demand drives supply. Um, things that kind of worked out later to be not uh, to be recognized as unscientific, but you know, this was very early days. Okay, so Thomas Jefferson was interested in the acquisition of land. And then the Louisiana Purchase became possible. Recall that starting in 1793, Britain and France were at war for the next 22 years. They took a little two-year hiatus in there. But other than that, they were at war for 22 years. At first, France was under a revolutionary government. Then ultimately, Napoleon became emperor of the French. And Napoleon at first thought, okay, well, Louisiana or, you know, the North American continent is a good place to possibly fight the British from. So they secretly, the French secretly acquired the Louisiana Territory from the Spanish. But then the Haitian Revolution broke out and demonstrated that France might want to kind of rein it in a little bit in terms of its global um, ambitions. And so the French, who definitely could use the money, offered to sell um, the Louisiana Purchase to the United States. New, um, Jefferson had first approached Napoleon and said, I'll give you $2 million for New Orleans. And then Napoleon turned around and said, what about if you give me $15 million for this whole big honk of territory? And so that is what actually happened. Did Jefferson make that decision by himself or did he combine with other people? I'm sure he, um, he talked with his cabinet, but he doesn't seem to have really talked with Congress about it. So this is one of those things where nowhere in the Constitution does anybody really have the, um, the responsibility or the right to acquire territory. So he just kind of moved into the... Exactly for himself. Yeah, exactly. So what year was the Louisiana Purchase? 1803. Okay. Other question? Okay. So Jefferson had a couple problems. First of all, that he was a strict constructionist. That is, he was, he had not been in favor of the Constitution originally. He did not believe in a large central government. So he wanted to interpret the Constitution as strictly as possible. So as you saw in the video in Jefferson's study, that little cartoon character holding the Louisiana map in one hand and the Constitution in the other, he had to kind of decide which was more important and ended up deciding that for the future of the Republic, it was more important that people have access to small farms for themselves than that he stick closely to what the Constitution said. 
A second issue that Jefferson had was the fact that a lot of French Canadians had been encouraged to move into the Louisiana Territory when it was under the control of Spain. So within Louisiana, and especially within the boundaries that we know of as the modern state of Louisiana, the French legal system had been adopted. Um, the French system of dividing up the land, not into counties, but into parishes had been adopted. Obviously people spoke French, Cajun French. And so the problem was how do you incorporate people who are not ethnically English into this new nation? And there ended up being some compromises. Um, Louisiana still has aspects of both, both the French Civil Code and the division into parishes today. If you ever listen to the news, they'll sometimes say, you know, this happened in such and such parish. Okay. Is the parish kind of the same idea as a county? It is kind of the same idea as a county. Parishes came from how France was divided up into um, sort of clerical regions, so that carried over. I also just want to um, direct your attention here to the Northwest Territory that I've discussed before. Here you see it has been divided up into Ohio, Indiana, Michigan and Illinois territories. It will be divided up even further. But you'll remember I talked about the Northwest Territory when I talked about the Articles of Confederation. All right. So now Jefferson has acquired for the United States this vast territory. And the problem is, how do we figure out what's there? And even more important from Jefferson's perspective, how can we find a river route to the Pacific? Well, well, you can't really find a river route to the Pacific because the Rocky Mountains are in the way, but he didn't know that at the time. Neither did Lewis and Clark. Meriwether Lewis was a 29-year-old captain in the army. Um, and he was asked to pick out who he wanted to lead the Corps of Discovery with him. He chose 33-year-old William Clark. Both men had had experience with command, with fighting in the wars against the indigenous people, um, with frontier or wilderness survival. But they were super different guys in terms of their personality and their skills. Meriwether Lewis was the more classically trained. He could write in correctly spelled and grammatical English. He was trained in botany and navigation by the stars and zoology. Lewis and Clark would keep journals of their um, expedition daily. And you can tell immediately who wrote the day's journal by looking at the spelling and grammar. If it's perfect, it was Lewis. If it's barely literate, it was William Clark. Lewis was a, um, I think, we might call him today a, a person with a touch of uh, neurodivergence or mental illness or something. He was a depressive guy who often got into a funk about things. In contrast, William Clark was a happy-go-lucky man who made friends easily. He, um, his training was that he was good at um, putting things together to make other things. He was kind of like a on-the-spot engineer. I would say he was like MacGyver, but I think that is a, a reference that is too old for you at this point. So they were very complementary, these two men. Their skills complemented each other. 
But it was not just the two of them who were on this journey. They had nine hunters from Kentucky, whose job it was to provide the Corps of Discovery with fresh hunted meat. They had 14 army soldiers to protect the group. There were two French watermen whose job it was to um, navigate the small boats. An interpreter who could speak English and French and one Native American language. And they had William Clark's um, enslaved black servant, York. Um, their French translator brought with him his 15 year old wife, Sacagawea. This is an artist's interpretation of what she may have looked like. If you've ever seen a dollar coin, there's another artist's interpretation of what Sacagawea might have looked like. Sort of dollar coin from, I think, the early 2000s or late 1990s. And it's based on a an artist um, making a drawing of a young indigenous woman who was attending UNM at the time. So I always think that's an interesting little factoid. Anyway, eight months pregnant, Sacagawea came with them because she could translate from the Native American language that her husband spoke into a couple of other Native American languages. One month into the journey, of course, she gave birth to a baby. And then for the remainder of the two-year um, core discovery mission, carried the baby around with her on her back on a cradle board. So as they were all schlepping through the Rocky Mountains and going by canoe, and at one point the canoes capsized and everybody fell into the river, she has the additional responsibility of having this baby. Um, the good thing about having a baby with them though, is it sort of immediately broadcast to whoever it was who encountered them that they were a peaceful mission, that they were not there to attack, because why would you bring a baby? Okay, so the point of the core of discovery, as I said, was to find a river route to the west. That wasn't going to happen. To find all kinds of animals and plants that there might be and to kind of like make a map of where they went and to name the natural features. Thomas Jefferson was super interested in science and he collected all kinds of specimens. Lewis and Clark sent back all kinds of birds and um, small animals. Some of these ended up in the Smithsonian Institution where they remain today, but I think they're probably in the basement rather than on display. Another of their purposes was to conduct diplomacy with native peoples. They had a big supply of metals with Thomas Jefferson's face on one side, and I'm not quite sure it was up on the other side, but they were to give these out as kind of peace tokens. Really though, the best way that they made friends with the Native Americans was by, um, was by doctoring them, was by using what few medical tools and knowledge they had to treat their illnesses, which might remind you of Cabeza de Vaca all the way at the beginning of the class. All right, so they sent back Buffalo robes, Native American attire, live squirrels, magpies, prairie hens, and they lived off the land and benefited from cooperation with the Native Americans. One of the neat stories is that Sacagawea, who had been kidnapped from the Shoshone tribe as a young person, just as they were coming into Shoshone territory, they needed horses. And so she was going to interpret for the Corps of Discovery with whatever Native Americans they happened to bump into. Turns out that the um, band that she bumped into was led by her brother. So 
there was a very happy reunion of the of Sacagawea who had been kidnapped as a baby or as a young person and her brother. And they got the horses. Were they mainly traveling by horses or was it walking? Or? Okay, here's how it worked. At first, they were mainly traveling by canoe. Then when they discovered there was not a navigable route, they started traveling by horses and on foot. Um, when they went through the Rocky Mountains, they had Indian guides, but they got really lost and they ended up eating their shoes, their horses, their candles. They stumbled out of the other side of the Rocky Mountains and were discovered by the Nez Perce Indians who wondered whether they should kill them or not. Seriously discussed, you know, to what extent are these people a danger? They decided not to kill them. They nursed them back to health. The Corps of Discovery got to the Oregon coast, got to the Pacific, waited around for a little bit and hoped that there would be a ship. Because they kind of thought, well, all right, we did this, we're done. Hopefully a ship will come by, no ship came by. They named the area where they had been scanning for a ship for disappointment. And then they took a vote about what they were gonna do. And so they all voted, including Sacagawea and York, to build a shelter where they overwintered, and then they came back. They arrived back in Missouri in 1806, much to the joy and celebrating of everyone. It would be kind of like today if we sent a mission to Mars, and the mission not only got to Mars, but came back from Mars. That's how jazzed everybody was. William Clark was made the governor of the Missouri Territory. And he also took Sacagawea's baby under his wing, had the young man educated. And so um, little Pompey Charbonneau, um, you know, enters history in that way, in his own right. Clark had in his office the best map of the West that existed all, you know, drawn through his own experiences with the West. Meriwether Lewis also, you know, got a big monetary bonus for having completed the Corps of Discovery mission, but he never readjusted to life back in the East. And ultimately, he was killed in 1809. He was found dead in a roadside tavern in Maryland. It is still unknown whether he um, killed himself or not, but as I say, he was a man who underwent periods of dark depression, so it would not have been entirely unfathomable for that to happen. Even while on the expedition, he would write about his depression? Yeah, um, when, for example, when uh, it was his birthday, he wrote something like, you know, Jesus at this point was the same age as I am, and he had accomplished this, that, and the other, and I have not even finished this core of discovery. Like, he was really hard on himself. So, oh, yeah. Question? Yes. Um, so how did people make maps at that time? Did they just go to, like, a high point and look around and draw what they see? Yes. And they would try to approximate um, shapes of ri rivers. They sometimes used uh, um, chains and, I forget what you call these things. They're like tripods um, that one person holds and another person wanders off with a chain that measures a specific amount of distance. And they use that no. to be kind of scale on a map. So these maps were not, sort of exact or accurate, but they were the best maps that, that Americans had, that Anglo-Americans had at this time. And considering they didn't even know when they set off that the Rocky Mountains existed or that there weren't dinosaurs roaming the plains or, you know, animals the size of dinosaurs, this is saying a lot. They really did gain a lot of knowledge. Other question? All 
All right, so after 1806, there was a big westward expansion on the part of Anglo-Americans. Population was increasing, pushing people westward. The population between 1800 and 1820 increased from 5 million to almost 10 million. Farms were overpopulated along the eastern seaboard and western land was available at $1.25 an acre, provided that you bought 640 acres at once. You could also do this thing called preemption where you would go beyond the bounds of the survey to land that was not yet surveyed for sale. You could till a crop, build a house, and you would be the person with first dibs on that land when it came up for sale. This westward expansion had a lot of impacts. Um, for example, there was environmental damage as people moved westward. If I were to draw how it was that people migrated from the east to the west, I would draw two arrows, one of them pointing from the northeast to the northwest and one pointing from the southeast to the southwest. Because of the Appalachians, there tended to be this flow of population where northern farmers went to the upper northern tier and continued to have sort of um, self-sufficient farming, not based on cash crops necessarily. And Southern farmers moved to the Southwest, by which I mean areas like what is today, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, in order to grow tobacco or cotton. Now cotton in particular wears out the soil, causes environmental damage, but there was so much land, or there seemed to be so much land, there was like an infinite supply of land, people could just wear out the soil and then keep moving west. There was lots of land speculation. You could make a profit of 40% on your investment if you bought land when it came on the market and then turned around and sold it to somebody who actually wanted to live there. It was the best investment opportunity available at the time. As a result of this, many people who wanted to actually settle on the land ended up buying it from people who had already purchased it from the government. And they bought it at inflated prices using banks to extend credit. And in 1819, there was a major bank panic due to the overvalued prices of some of this land. And the first of the about every 20 year recessions or depressions, or as they call them in the 19th century, panics occurred. So bank panics caused financial instability and also political instability. Another consequence of expansion, of course, was that the settlers moving westward were ruthless toward Native Americans. They didn't see them as the rightful owners of the land. And sometimes this ruthlessness elicited a violent reaction from the indigenous people. So to give you one example, the Shawnees had two leaders, Tecumseh, who was a political leader, and his brother Tenskwatawa, who was a religious leader, also known as the Prophet. And as Indian tribes clashed with Anglo-Americans, they got together a kind of pan-Indian or like multiple tribes put together revolt based on a vision that Tenskwatawa had had. 
they thought if we can just reject all of the Anglo-American input into our society and go back to our native ways, we can repel this Anglo incursion. They wanted an end to private property, a readoption of hunting bows and arrows, refraining from eating bread, going back to the three sisters of corn, beans, and squash, releasing their domestic animals back into the wild. Um, cutting off all interaction with whites and especially with their alcohol. So Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa were able to unite the tribes. They fought against Anglo settlers moving westward. And one of the most important battles that they fought, which was actually a draw, was the Battle of Tippy Canoe in 1811. Casualties were about equal on both sides, but William Henry Harrison, who led the American troops, claimed victory. And in the 1840s, well, in 1840, when he ran um, for election to the presidency, he used Tippy Canoe and Tyler II as his slogan. As we're going to see, this kind of unrest with Native Americans on the frontier is one of the things that's going to cause the United States to declare war against the British, because the perception was that the British were helping Native Americans, supplying them with guns, supplying them with food, riling them up against Anglo settlers. Another part of the um, wars, uh, the indigenous people at this time was the Red Stick War, which lasted from 1813 to 1814. It was fought mainly in Alabama after the Creeks, Creek Native Americans attacked Fort Mims in a surprise attack. And then um, the American troops responded by joining together with the Creek's uh, traditional enemies to repel them. The battle or the war ended with a treaty in 1814 in which the Creek surrendered more than half their territory to the US. And I should say that um, Andrew Jackson was a very important leader of troops in the Red Stick War. In 1822, Sharon Tarish, a Pawnee chief, led a delegation of 16 Plains Indians to Washington to express the feelings of Native Americans about the American Westward Movement. And he said, the great spirit made us all. He made my skin red and yours white. He placed us on this earth and intended that we should live differently from each other. He made the whites to cultivate the earth and feed on domestic animals, but he made us red skins to row through the uncultivated woods and plains to feed on wild animals and to dress in their skins. He also intended that we should go to war to take scalps, steal horses and triumph over our enemies cultivate peace at home and promote the happiness of each other. I believe there are no people of any color on this earth who do not believe in the great spirit in rewards and punishments. And he went on to say, some of your good chiefs, or as they are called missionaries, have proposed to send some of their good people among us to change our habits, to make us work and to live like white people. I am like you, my great father. I love my country, I love my people. I love the manner in which we live and think myself and my warriors brave. Spare me then, my father, let me enjoy my country and pursue the buffalo and the beaver and the other wild animals of the wilderness, and I will trade the skins with your people. I have grown up and lived this long without work. I am in hopes that you will suffer me to die without it. 
We have yet plenty of buffalo, beaver, deer, and other wild animals. We also have an abundance of horses. We have everything we want. We have plenty of land if you will keep your people off of it. All right, so this was a pretty plaintive plea for being left alone. And yet being left alone was not what happened. So do you think like before Westward expansion, if we kind of had some like criteria set that, hey, we have to leave the native tribes alone. Hey, we have two different cultures that we aren't going to be the same. Do you think that idea of like the Indians were bad people and we have to kill them all, they're savages, like that would have been non-existent if we kind of set up an idea of that? It, in theory, yes. But the Americans at the time had a very strong sense of their own cultural superiority. Somebody recently, um, a guy who was very much derided on Twitter by other historians, wrote an article saying, what should the Europeans have done with Native Americans? And he thought, or he was trying to argue that, well, in the long run, they benefited because, you know, we took over capitalism, it's great. And, you know, it's okay that they lost their culture because now we're all much more prosperous. So the idea of we really ought to leave them alone, this is their land, et cetera, kind of wasn't occurring to people at the time. And some people still argue that, oh, it was just one. All right. Since the old Northwest tended to be populated by people from the free states, and the Old Southwest by people from the slave states. The cultural tension of North and South was replicated there, and you can see here how that worked. Um, you can see uh, where the free states are. They are the red states here. The slave states are the green states. And then in 1820, there was the question of, should Missouri come in? as a free state or a slave state. Now at that time, if you look at the map, you see that the entire Southwest was under the, was in the control of Mexico, which had just acquired their independence from Spain. That Oregon country was jointly claimed by the US and Britain. So it looked as though the land that people were going to expand into was was free state land. And the states that didn't have slavery were happy about that. But Southerners said, Congress doesn't have the right to regulate the growth of slavery. And so it seemed as though the two sides might even descend into civil war. Although secession was bandied about in Congress, a gifted legislator from Kentucky by the name of Henry Clay proposed a compromise. He said, all right, how about this? Missouri comes in as a slave state. Maine, which at that point had just been an extra part of Massachusetts, comes in as a free state. And then we draw a line across the rest of the continent at 36 degrees, 30 minutes of latitude. Okay, so you see that red line? That red line right above Arkansas territory, that is the 3630 line. Now, if we don't imagine too far into the future, we might say, oh, well, that's good for the free states. But as it turns out, in the 1840s, the United States will win the whole Southwest from Mexico. And that opens up the opportunity for lots of slave states to come in because they are below that line of 36 degrees, 30 minutes of latitude. Or to put this another way, the land question, the question of whether new states coming in are going to be slave states or free states is one of the most